Everybody, welcome back. We're going to talk about chronic ankle instability. You heard about acute ankle instability earlier in the night or in the morning, depending on where you are. Now we're talking about the chronic ones. I want to thank uh, Ardalan for sponsoring the session and our moderator to walk us through this is Dr. Arvind Puri. Thanks, Arvind. Well, welcome, everybody. And thank you very much, Celine, for giving us this opportunity. I have been involved with this meeting last year and it was a very thought-provoking, informative, and an extremely entertaining meeting. And I must say, I've been following this since this meeting started and it is living up to its standard. So without much ado, I'm going to start introducing the panel for this session on chronic ankle instability. First up is Ben Foster. Ben is a Brisbane-based foot and ankle surgeon and he's an avid sports follower. He's very closely involved with the Queensland Red Rugby Union, the Brisbane Lions, the North Queensland Cowboys, as well as the Gold Coast Suns. He'll be talking to us about the presentation and the options in the management of this condition. Next up will be Nick Jorgensen, who also presented at this meeting last year with calcaneal fractures. He also is based in Brisbane as an orthopedic surgeon with a foot and ankle uh, interest, especially sports. And he'll be talking about injuries associated with chronic lateral ligament instability, not to be missed and to be managed appropriately. Last, but definitely not the least, is Amy. Amy Tuzel is based in Mornington Peninsula and Melbourne. She's a foot and ankle surgeon who's avidly involved in sports injuries, MIS, as well as ankle arthroplasty. She'll be talking to us about the specific issues which affect the female athletes as far as ankle instability is concerned. So, Ben, could you please share your screen and start the presentation? Thank you. How are we going, Zed? You're good. Um, Great. Uh, thanks, Arvind. So, and thanks for having us on board. Um, again, like it's a big topic, and and there's been like through the um, through the topics. Um, I'll get actually go on to um, there. We go um, through the topics. There'll be a bit of crossover. I think if people have been on for a while, and hopefully won't step on anyone's toes. So, but um, it's a huge like chronic instability is a huge issue. That's uh, these are. You know, just pick the NCAA. It's a, just a huge, like, sporting institution. And 7 to 15% of collegiate sort of injuries means that you're, you're seeing, um, in terms of your athletes, uh, like, in loss of game time, uh, a huge problem. And there's probably sort of like a, you know, we probably underreport it because a lateral ligament injury is relatively common and where, um, and they, like, there'll be players and sort of, and certainly sort of um, punters off the street that, that don't present for medical advice and, until uh, late, late in the piece. So I think our role or, um, is really to try and de define in this um, what, what, mean, what, what you mean by chronic ankle instability. Are they, um, and probably what we're after is the group that are, um, you know, the combination of both functional and mechanical instability. We can examine these patients and, you know, and we've all got patients that, um, with generalised ligamentous laxity and you can stick their ankle at the other end of the room and they're mechanically unstable, but from a functional point of view, really quite good. Whereas we'll have patients the other way, really, where we, we don't think their examination findings are that sort of uh, too gruesome, and, um, but functionally they're terrible. So um, so we've got to, that, like the, the difficulty is trying to sort of find that patient. The um, We all know that um, that like there's long-term ramifications about leaving that chronically unstable group because we'll see them you know, 10, 15, 20 years down the track after relatively innocuous sort of like symptoms but just recurrent problems and they've got arthritic issues. So, so that's our problem. Um, the anatomy, the only, I don't want to dwell too much on this really, but, but like there's a couple of things that are important for me. The, um, uh, the position of your AITFL, you know, in the or diagnosis, you're just making sure that you're not dealing with a syndesmotic problem. The calcaneofibular ligament, I think for me is important. They're just the sort of the dual limbs, the perineals run it running between. It's just understanding sort of what that thing does. And if, um, and obviously if we go back historically, the extended retinaculum, like in, you know, in Gould's modifications, important. So the PTFL, um, you know, it rarely sort of from a clinical point of view, does that become an issue for us? But but just important to sort of know where everything's kind of sitting. So 
so in my initial assessment, like again, the mechanism of injury for uh, for these patients is really important. If um, um, you know, and you know, and Andrew mentioned, Andrew Wines mentioned yesterday that everything gets videoed these days. You know, but you know, the patient will tell you which way the ankle went. Most of the time, they've got a fair idea. And, uh, and the mechanism sort of involved in doing it, be it in a tackle or like a change of direction sort of exercise or, and uh, so you, what you're trying to work out in that is really what's gone and where the position of the foot is. So, um, and some of this is sport specific. So like if in, in, um, in the group of patients that you're looking after, like the importance of the timing in the season, so be it sort of like early season, mid season, late season, um, makes a difference in, um, you know, position that I made like where again, um, uh, with a lot of football sports in Australia say, um, you know, it's sort of whether like a, uh, 130 kilo rugby prop who sort of has only stepped once in his life. And that was onto a bar stool, um, like is involved or whether it's sort of like a surf athlete that runs in the, uh, in the sand all the time. So, the, like understanding what the athlete or what your patient needs out of their ankle is important. Um, yeah, their immediate weight bearing status, it's sort of, that goes back to sort of first principles, but it actually makes a big difference to like the degree of their injury and your appreciation of it and the location of their swelling, you know? So um, sometimes they'll, they'll be, you know, really concerned that they've got this huge swelling that sort of extends up um, uh, uh, proximal to the ankle, but it's more a function of sort of like what's happened distally and it might not change your um, overall treatment. And so uh, quickly through these, inversion and internal rotation, adduction and plantar flexion, um, your ATFL will rupture with those, but it ruptures in its mid substance. It's got really quite poor sort of resistance to like a tensional sort of load. So, so ATFL going is, is like is garden variety sort of stuff. And if, um, Probably the sort of mechanism that gets your calcaneo fibula ligament most is inversion in, uh, with the ankle in dorsiflexion. So you're locking it up a little bit more. And so, um, so again, they're just looking for those little keys to sort of what you're going to expect on examination. So, so for me, I'm, I'm kind of examining these patients really with a purpose to try and um, you know, like they, they find the things that are going to influence what we're doing sort of treatment wise. So, I mean, the first um, the varus ankle is like, is that, you know, the take home one um, and probably importantly and, and particularly importantly in the, in that elite group um, is really whether it's forefoot or hindfoot driven. So, um, you know, the, uh, we'll get to sort of like the treatment for it later, but like there's some of those can be addressed really quite sort of easily. Um, I harped up on about this late in that last talk, but um, there's a point of difference between the insertion of your, ATFL sort of here on your fibula, um, ATFL and AITFL. And so the point of tenderness in those and, uh, is actually sort of like definable. And so, and I think if you're, if you match your mechanism really with that, then um, uh, you'll go a long way to sort of like uh, to working out what's going on. Uh, associated injuries, I won't deal with too much. I'll, like that's, uh, Nick will ca cover that. And if, um, but I'm, I'm essentially sort of like looking to um, uh, my anterior draw and probably the only, the only thing to sort of take home in these really is, and is really just making sure that you're fixing the talus. What you're moving is the talocrural joint. Um, uh, you know, people talk about subtalar joint instability. I find that really difficult to appreciate, but you can stick your fat thumb on the lateral process of the talus in a talar tilt. Um, uh, that's important. So um, the dynamic test, hop, hopping and taping really give you a bit of a clue as to which way they're going to head in their rehab sort of process. Um, special tests, again, we've covered this with the syndesmotic stuff, but uh, but medial instability is sort of something that you'll see. And like we, again, you know, it might be sort of localised to Australia, but the AFL group particularly where they, and, and even the basketball is where they're coming down over the sort of top of another player's foot that sort of that injury really will often sort of result in sort of almost frank sort of medial instability and so um, so being able to sort of appreciate that that's uh, just something not to be missed and um and again that sort of like you know the registrar's problem the generalized ligamentous laxity you know do you change where you go dependent on that um of course they all turn up with an mri scan these days and if um 
Uh, so that you know, so that ultimately the the problem for us is sort of like is actually referring your patients back for an X ray sometimes, and if um uh, again the associated injuries will pop up in those, and probably that's all you need in this group. Um, you know, there's MRI scan helps, but it's if you're making a decision based on their symptoms in your examination, it probably doesn't help other than to exclude the things that might influence their rehab. So. You, know, you can exclude syndesmotic injuries and probably in the group that you're looking at, if you think that they're predominantly a lateral ligament instability, it's just that supination, adduction sort of group. And if, um, uh, for mine, uh, it's an adjunct to your treatment MRI scan. It's sort of, it's certainly not a, like an indication and, and we'll, you know, we will see people like, you know, like get, that have an operation based on sort of on a report. So, but I, you know, for mine, it's sort of like, you know, it gives me an idea that I can sort of see the perineals. That I'm just looking for the other things that might influence where we end up. These slides are really just more to sort of show you when there's a, a massive gap in that sort of like your ATFL, if it's avulsed off the sort of fibular side or your calcaneal fibular ligaments sort of gone, all that blood's going to track. And if, um, um, and so, and it'll track sort of northwards and, and particularly if they're sort of, uh, they're good about it, sort of elevating and icing. It's going to sort of, it's going to drift up their leg. Um, that medial impaction sort of injury here, sort of like onto that sort of medial malleolus, uh, often gets called a deltoid ligament injury, um, but it's an impaction injury rather than sort of like a distraction injury. So it's just getting those little things out of the report. Um, just little subtle things like, you know, the perineals kind of sliding around the corner or, and your calcaneofibular ligament is completely going. So you've got no restraint to um, the sort of the course of your perineals. They're just little things to sort of like to pick up on so that you can get an idea of sort of what you might have to deal with if you're, if you're seeing them in like at you know, time of surgery. So that chicken little approach, you know, like everything's busted. I've got to operate on it. I, I, I don't, I really don't agree. I sort of like uh, across the sort of groups, there's, there's probably a, a small group that, um, even in that uh, that elite setting, that sort of will do well with an acute um, intervention, but um, but a lot of the time it's it's a matter of like rehabbing them properly and then seeing where they end up. Um, um, my the point about timing is is sort of like again, you know, it's where they these guys end up in there or girls end up in the season. If um, if you can think, um, you know, if if you're doing this late in the season, it might be sort of like a, a like there might be a window of opportunity that sort of presents itself from uh, from an acute injury. Um, how long do you give them in their rehab before you decide that they like that they're failing? And so, and what you're really looking for in that is to sort of like how good their perineal sort of strength is, how comfortable they are, and sort of if, um, if they're comfortable and they're like their strength is okay, but they still feel unstable, then that's just a bit of a red flag. Uh, your technique, um, I think like that everyone will have their sort of variation. I'll just go through what I do. It's not like a, not a gold standard at all. It's just what you kind of settle on after sort of times. But but there's certainly differences between the cases that you do. And again, it, like you're using your examination and also that um, uh, your MR scan to sort of to find that group that so you're not missing sort of something that's going to influence their recovery. So. And that's probably the role of arthroscopy in this group. There's, if there's associated injuries, what you're really looking for in those is to sort of is present yourself um, with an ankle that's pretty good, like, and then you're going to reconstruct it. So um, we've been through those a bit. Like the athlete's history is important. If there's, um, um, if there's an, an injury in that, that's sort of like an acute on sort of chronic thing, that's, a lot of the times they'll, you know, they'll put up with an unstable ankle for like a fair period of time and um, live with it, strapped it, braced it and, um, and been able to sort of function with it. And then there's the straw that breaks the camel's back. So um, if that happens, then like that might be like an avenue that sort of says, well, look, take the time, get it right and then move from there. Obviously there's a lot of other things that come into that, but um, um and I'm um, I'm very keen to make sure that it's like an instability problem rather than pain. So um, getting rid of those associated sort of issues, making sure that sort of uh, the instability is their sort of um, their main their main issue. Like that's probably the thing that I'm looking for. 
um, functional parameters, like they need to be able to sort of like uh, uh, to at least have some progression to um, uh, to their rehab almost before you start. So you're trying to give them as good as you can before you actually operate. So I'm looking for a clean slate. I'll arthroscope all my uh, reconstructions. I think um, uh, uh, in some we're not doing much, in some we're doing a lot. And if um, uh, I'll change my incision based on my pathology, if I know that there's a significant perineal pathology, I'll I'll move more posteriorly. Uh, but my standard incision is a sort of um, is a curved incision over the line of the fibula anteriorly. Um, I, if you can think that like we all talked about sort of like the Gould modification of the brostrum repair, but, and then Carlson sort of really talked about, um, lifting and sort of shortening the sort of ligaments. Probably what we, what I do these days is more in line with that. Um, it's probably a combination of both. Um, um, I'll use suture anchors. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure most people would in some form, but, um, but I'll use a four strand, I'll use two four strand um, uh, ligament anchors so I can get a broad breadth of, um, of suture across um, um, a wide group. Um, the suture anchors actually go in the sort of the calcaneo fibula and ATFL footprint. So, um, so I'm lifting them off, um, debriding the bone. Um, I'll lift a periosteal flap. Um, because when I'm bringing it back, I'll sort of, I'll, I'll find the perineals, take them away and put a deep suture, um, in the deep part of the calcaneo fibula ligament and then sort of, and then reconstruct the superficial part of it as well. And, um, uh, pans over vest with a periosteal sort of flap and do the same with the ATFL. So, um, so I want a kind of three layered repair and, um, and it, as an operation, it's probably one of the more reliable ones that if, um, and so, um, so in that, you just want to make sure that you're well and truly sort of happy that it's um, uh, that you've got it sort of solid before you, you get off the table. Um, I do hold the ankle sort of over reduced when I tighten them. So um, in that chronic instability group, if um, uh, so, they'll be in slight eversion. And I actually do a, um, a slight posterior draw as well for my ATFL tightening. So. Um, the reconstruction conundrums over the years, non-anatomic repairs. I'm not sure that, um, you know, I certainly like that, that was something we were basically doing sort of way back in my training almost, but I don't think I've done one for, um, you know, over 20 years. And if I'm, um, uh, I can see the role for arthroscopic assisted um, uh, like uh, reconstructions, but, um, but I'm not, uh, sure that um, uh, you're in position to sort of take a, like a little bit of a risk in a, in a high level athlete. I don't, um, and particularly I'm a little more concerned that um, it like relies on a safe window sort of for you to sort of bring your sutures in and out. And, um, and that like, you know, there's probably a, you know, a, a risk even with an open procedure. So that worries me a little bit. So I haven't sort of gone down that line too much, you know, we've all experimented with it, but, but not being a great believer in it. So, um, and as, as well for me, I don't, I don't tend to use um, an augmented uh, device repair. So, but I will use, um, uh, I will use like um, a, a, a tissue sort of like augmented repairs. So I'll go through those in a minute, but um, the pitfalls, um, the various hind foot. So what I was getting at before is that I think in an athletic sort of population, I think they'll tolerate, a dorsiflexion osteotomy of the first ray a lot more than they will calcaneal osteotomy. Um, doable, but it's a longer, it's certainly a longer recovery. Um, what do you do in the arthritic patient? I think there's there's an element of uh, of that really that sort of you know it, uh, you can you, you know there is a, probably a group that might benefit from it, but you've got to be really cautious about that. Uh, duration of laxity, uh, generalised ligamentous laxity, like in that group, the question is whether you augment your repair, like in the initial setting. Um, my practice really hasn't been to, and um, um, because I, I think the results of, you know, uh, broadly of like of an anatomic repair are really quite good, and uh, there'll be a group that sort of fail that, but I think the, the greater majority do pretty well. So I use uh, a gracilis graph for my um, revision reconstructions and my augmented repairs. Um, I pinched um, Arthrex picture because it sort of actually sort of 
as a good sort of explanation about where I stick my sort of like my graph, but essentially I'm using one graft and sort of, um, and putting it through a small bony window in the perineal tunnel and bringing them out through the medial border. And, um, and I just hold them with um, interference screws through both talus and calcaneus. So um, I have used allograft in the past, really when everything else has been taken, but, um, but never been uh, a great um, exponent of that. And, and I, I don't. I tend not to use the synthetic grafts. I've, I've, uh, I've just been, um, I've been burnt by them in the past. And um, so, in my post-op rehab on my standard reconstructions is again um, about seven to ten days in the back slab. And it's, um, and as Andy was pointing out, if like you know, not sometimes I'll come back in, you know, a boot or a brace or like you know, without you sort of knowing, but. But ultimately, like I do think they do well with like early compression and ice, and um, I'll try to get them doing at least in line range of motion, sort of pretty early in the piece, and that's sort of within that two, you know, ten day, two week mark, and and starting to do some resistant calf work. I I don't think we can gain anything by doing things early, but we can certainly lose a little bit less, and um, I get them weight bearing sort of for that uh, around about the three to four week mark, really dependent on their comfort, but keep them in a boot. Uh, for six weeks and um, and then I'll keep them in a brace full time for that following six weeks. Um, I'm keen on early uh, proprioception. I think the earlier we can get that sort of back into them, um, the better they'll do. I think there's certainly an element of mechanical uh, control from your reconstruction, but really what you're relying on is to sort of, is to give them some feedback and the earlier they get that back, the better they'll be. Um, not too fussed about sort of their uh, their knee to wall. I think if they get in the same ballpark, I'm usually um, happy for them to run. But I want their calf strength pretty good. And if um, and there's a big difference between returning to training as to returning to sport. So um, and certainly that's a really quite sport specific and um, you know problem. And uh, and Amy will probably touch on it. But that uh, netball is like is hard work and. Um, uh, on an ankle and um, and like it's predominantly sort of female sport and um, and so that type of sort of sporting group uh, will often sort of struggle. Thank you. I'll stop sharing. Thank you, Ben. Thank you very much indeed. Nick, you're on next and you're going to talk about the associated injuries and when not to miss them and then try and address them at the same time, perhaps, when you're dealing with the ankle instability. Yeah, thank you very much, Alan. Thank you uh, for the opportunity. And uh, it's good to follow on from Ben. He's covered up uh, a lot of stuff in more detail. My practice is probably a little bit different. I certainly don't deal with too many uh, elite athletes. I get more of the community sports people and a fair proportion of people who uh, injure their um, uh, ankles on a Saturday night down at the pub in high heels or on gutters. Um, but uh, certainly you see a good collection of um, uh, interesting pathology. I think it's important uh, to define what chronicity is, um, as well as the co-pathologies that I think need to be running through your head and other considerations throughout uh, your assessment of these patients. Uh, Hurdle and uh, his uh, in their group um, early made these definitions back in 2002, but is really any interruption of activity greater than 12 months, which seems quite a, like a long time, because I think probably a fair proportion of these patients don't really have to make it to the 12 months before they start acting like they're a chronic injury um, or a missed injury. And certainly they all need to have recurrent episodes and whether or not, as, as Ben was saying, that's just the perception of it um, uh, or, or actual feelings of giving way, I think both are important to sort of uh, tease out in your, in your history. Um, and at the end of the day, it's, it's self-reported. And I think it's a, a very clear point in, um, uh, in looking at patients with co-pathologies that you really do need to extrapolate what is pain and what is actually instability. And unfortunately, sometimes there's going to be an element of both. I think the co-pathologies that, or the component injuries that I'd uh, like to sort of uh, broadly speak on is, uh, is obviously syndesmotic injuries, the ankle joint itself, um, and both uh, whether that's just pure impingement style a pathology or what's happening to the cartilage uh, on both the tibia or the tailor side. The perineals on the lateral side and any um, persistent uh, ossicles, if there's been a history of um, multiple episodes of um, acute on chronic injuries. Uh, fractures that uh, tend to sort of happen around the area base, uh, based on the fifth metatarsal base, as well as the anterior calcaneal process, 
and you can obviously have uh, sometimes a little bit more severe injuries um, uh, affecting the um, uh, tibial talar joint as well. Any medial instability uh, we need to consider, and it usually uh, falls into the pattern of uh, being uh, the, uh, the tibio navicular uh, uh, band of the, the deltoid ligament. Subtalar joint uh, needs to be considered. Uh, whether or not there's any instability going through that area or if there's any uh, evidence of sinus tarsi syndrome. And then superficial perineal nerve uh, can be injured. Typically, that's probably more commonly seen in the acute uh, injuries where it's a traction neuropraxia. And certainly, there's not much in the literature about uh, chronic injuries, but it's something to be aware of. And certainly, if someone's had a, a history of uh, recurrency uh, um, uh, before presenting to yourself on, on, a, on a long background, it's something um, certainly to define before you operate on them as well. Um, other considerations, I think, uh, as Ben was mentioning, you, you really do need to understand uh, what element of arthritic changes are in, um, in the ankle joints, and that uh, needs to be sort of treated uh, um, carefully with what you may or may not choose to do. I think hind foot alignment um, is absolutely essential uh, not to miss, and um, that's, um, uh, that, that will also obviously tailor what uh, other concomitant pathologies you might need. I've touched on the fact that subtalar joint need to be considered. And in the background, I think we should always consider a tarsal coalition, though probably it's not the right population or the presentation necessarily in the, in the chronic setting. Assessments, x-rays uh, of vital importance and like a standard uh, AP lateral uh, weight bearing. Uh, relevant Im imaging is, uh, can be considered CT and MRI. And the, the, the problems with MRI is that it's actually not an extremely useful uh, investigation. There's been a few studies uh, out there that's shown even orthopedically trained um, surgeons have a uh, poor, poor ability to um, define uh, prominent pathology such as uh, ossicles, synovitis, any tailor lesions. I think for my um, uh, role, MR is absolutely vital for trying to work out what's going on with the perineal side of things, as well as any um, evidence of syndesmotic uh, disruption. Uh, sometimes an axial CT uh, in comparison to the other side. Uh, can sometimes give me a little bit of information about uh, if there's any sort of disruption as well. And the key point of probably this whole talk, as, as Ben has just said, is I think arthroscopy is essential. And I wouldn't do a lateral ligament reconstruction without doing arthroscopy. Um, for me, that's um, step one uh, to ensure that I'm not missing anything that I need to be addressing. And I'll talk about the, the things that um, need to look at. And they're also going to form basis of your prognosis in the future as well. Uh, De Hoog, uh looked at uh, just the um, huge variety, but also a surprising numbers of, of uh, injuries uh, and other pathologies found on arthroscopy. And then I've circled the chondral injury because they've reported in cases of anywhere up to about 56%. <clears throat> and that's not uh, lining up with what we see uh, in studies that are reported on MRI. So I think it probably hopefully drives home the point of that. In terms of starting from the lateral side, it's usually the central portion of the perineus brevis that tears. Um, and that's uh, thought to be that um, there's uh, some redundancy in the superficial perineal retinaculum, allowing that translation um, in that central portion to you know, unfortunately uh, get attenuated and fray on the uh, fibular tip. Uh, in my history, I'm looking at any evidence of retromariolar pain as well as uh, subluxation with uh, circumduction, both um, uh, resisted and, and, uh, and passive. I, I do feel like MRI is probably a key point in this, and, and as Ben suggested, um, usually you, if you fail to sort of identify this too early on in your planning, you're sometimes you're, my, my standard incisions at the anterior uh, element of the fibula as well, sometimes you have to make that cut a fair bit bigger than you might otherwise have to. So I think that's probably an important thing not to miss. And then I'm looking at repairing anything that's greater than 50% um, with a side to side repair. I haven't uh, been in the case where I've had to, uh, had an unsalvageable perineal tear, but it's something that, um, uh, I'd have to sort of work out at the time. And I'm looking at reconstructing uh, the superficial perineal uh, retinacula. And it's usually uh, got an element of redundancy in there. Lateral ossicles um, are typically asymptomatic. They're reported in about 25%. What you do with them uh, uh, is, is potentially excise them. Uh, you can consider a fibrous takedown and infusion of the tip if it's quite large. Um, and I guess that's a, probably an on-table assessment um, by how closely related or how, how large that fragment is compared to the perineal uh, uh, tendons in, the, in their tracking. And there's certainly mixed importance in the literature. Syndesmosis uh, is something clearly not to be missed and Ben touched on the fact that um, in the acute athletes and um, the ability to really extrapolate or, or get a good history about where the foot is in position when that injury happens. 
Um, uh, again, I tend to get my patients a little bit later after the presentation. So uh, delving into the specifics of injury sometimes uh, feels like banging my head against the wall. But um, my preference in this case is obviously uh, assessment on MRI and then uh, arthroscopy is the gold standard. And I tend to use a suspensory fixation. Uh, I've never really had to do an open debridement, the AOTFL, if it's particularly hypertrophied um, for any sort of um, uh, reconstruction. Um, typically re repairing these uh, at the size with su suspensory fixation. And I'm using intraoperative imaging and arthroscopy to assess the reduction. The osteochondral lesions of the talus is probably the, the most meaty um, subject of all of this. Uh, again, it goes to the point that arthroscopy is essential. Uh, what's defined as chondral lesions and osteochondral lesions has a huge variety um, on imaging preoperatively. Um, and, um, and, and I think we uh, need to be aware of what we're dealing with. Um, the degree of damage uh, that we can uh, see on um, uh, interoperative arthroscopy uh, is related to how chronic patients have their uh, instability. It's also increased with their patient age and uh, how much tailor to put on uh, weight bearing preoperative uh, imaging as well. And that will again start to form a basis of, um, of uh, prognosis uh, with your patients after your, your lateral ligament reconstruction. And then uh, they are more likely, or there's a correlation with any deltoid ligament instability in the setting of your lateral ankle um, incompetence. Uh, the three main arms I have is debridement, uh, microfracture if they're less than 15 mils. They'll probably actually increase that to about 20 mils um, in, in most of the population. And then I'm uh, looking at OATS procedures if it's over 20 millimetres, if they're a reliable um, uh, patient group. Uh, I haven't had much experience in that, um, and so I defer obviously to my senior uh, panel uh, when it comes to the oats, but I think that's uh, something that we uh, can have in the back pocket. Ankle impingement is probably there to some degree. Um, uh, certainly soft tissue impingement is probably present in, in a vast majority of patients, and certainly uh, debriding uh, the anterior element of the tibio joint as well as clearing up the lateral gutter uh, uh, probably happens in the vast majority of cases in, in the chronic setting. Uh, again, a clinical examination and history are, are all useful. If I um, uh, sometimes, if the patient comes in and they haven't really had a, a good uh, rehabilitation history or, or efforts or sustained um, ability to progress through that, I'll try anti inflammatories or HLA injections to uh, settle the inflammation down. Um, though, uh, and typically that uh, gives some benefit when the patients are on uh, waiting for their procedure. And typically, there's excellent results when it's arthroscopically divided, and I think it forms the basis of every uh, procedure. The medial sides, there's differing reports within the literature. I try to do a medial rotary draw test while trying to bring the, um, the medial side through after um, uh, fixing down on the, the, um, uh, the uh, lateral side once I fixed it. Though, in the preoperative assessment, uh, sorry, in the um, pre reconstruction assessment, I'm usually looking at both the MRI and the oblique axial plane to see if there's any disruption. Otherwise, arthroscopically uh, driving through the, um, uh, the the camera and seeing how much uh, uh, tilt and uh, laxity you have on that medial side. Hinterman uh, was the first to describe it and, and, and has a classification system that's, uh, that, that's useful. And it's all derived around the size of your scope, essentially. And as I mentioned before, it's usually a, a type 1 cr a chronic injury, which is... Uh, caused by the uh, tibia navicular band, and um, you can do repair or, or reconstruction um, once you've uh, addressed the lateral side uh, through a small uh, medial incision. And then finally, I've mentioned that the fact that there is neuropraxia that we should be uh, appreciated. I think uh, by the time that they fall into that chronic uh, period, um, uh, what you can do for it surgically is, uh, is certainly uh, not a whole lot, and, and I think they're distributing a lot of symptoms of uh, complex regional pain syndrome. Uh, the timing of surgery probably needs to be carefully um, uh, uh, weighed up with uh, what sort of position they're in. Um, but I think it's important to sort of note it, particularly in the acute setting or if they've had a recent uh, acute um, uh, side of things. With all of this, the risk factors for co-pathologies, uh, the frequency is increased with age. Uh, they're typically seen in the later 30s uh, uh, population uh, compared to the uh, under 30s. There doesn't seem to be any relationship with gender. Um, and there is a certainly worse prognosis uh, with concomitant injuries uh, revolving specifically around the symptomatic injuries as well as the medial instability uh, injury pattern. Uh, perineal injuries, there's probably a, a mixed literature out there, but uh, again, I don't think it diminishes the importance of addressing what's going on.
I think uh, I haven't gone through my process of rehab. Um, I tend to try and keep it as similar to bends as possible and get them on track uh, for uh, aggressive ankle range of motion once the wounds have healed. Um, and weight bearing really depends on uh, the other sort of surgeries that are going on at that time. Um, I think you have to have a high index of suspicion. I think relevant imaging is uh, an MRI and uh, weight bearing x-rays. You really do need to consider alignment uh, concerns as well as uh, arthritic concerns. Uh, arthroscopy is essential in, in, in my opinion, and I try to address everything at the same time and it uh, may help with some of the uh, basis of prognosis for your patient in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick, for a very comprehensive coverage of the topic. So may I request Amy, please, to uh, share her screen. Thank you, Amy. No worries. So thanks so much for the opportunity to present. It's certainly a, a different style of meeting, which uh, is really interesting. And some of the talks have been amazing. And thanks also uh, to Ben and Nick. Uh, I'm an orthopedic surgeon based on the Mornington Peninsula in Australia. And whether it just ends up being the patient population that are referred to me or whether it's a reflection of the athletic population we have down here, I tend to get a lot of young female athletes come through my private practice. And then what I did notice is I was starting to get a lot of post-pregnancy athletes uh, come through my practice as well. And at one stage, we had a waiting room full of uh, women who were particularly sporty, kept their sport up during their pregnancies, had a baby and were making a comeback from having a baby. And I had a room full of these kind of women all breastfeeding their babies and our secretaries were running, you know, cups of water and glasses, you know, cups of tea and glasses of water to these women in my waiting room. And I thought there's got to be something in here about ankle instability and uh, pregnancy and hormones and female athletes. So I started to look into it uh, in a bit more detail. So what we're going to talk about today is the rise in recognition of women's sport in Australia, and this has increased the incidence and the severity of injury that these women are getting. There are hormonal and anatomical risk factors for injuries, specifically in female athletes. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the role of an orthopedic surgeon and what can we do when managing uh, these female athletes, particularly ones coming back from pregnancy and injury. So for the Australians that are online, I appreciate it's about five o'clock uh, in the morning in New York. So well done if you're still awake. But women's AFL or Australian rules football has really taken off in Australia uh, in the last couple of years. And it's raised profile not only of women's AFL, but women's sport uh, in general in Australia, because there is a lot of funding coming in for women's sport now. And we're looking at uh, increases in women's rugby union, women's rugby league, and I'm sure Ben, uh, my co-presenter, has seen an increase in women's rugby union injuries uh, through his practice as well. However, with this has caused an increase uh, in the injury rates that women are suffering. We know that there is an increased incidence of non-contact ACL ruptures in females specifically, and women are high, eight times higher than men, more likely to have a non-contact ACL injury. There are anatomic, genetic, and hormonal factors that do contribute that. And we had a good discussion at our Victorian branch of the Australian Orthopaedic Association meeting last week about why women in particular get ACL injuries over men. And we look at things like valgus knees, having a high notch, and also hormonal factors that we'll talk about a little bit later in this talk. However, where there is a very limited discussion in foot and ankle uh, injuries, and I think perhaps as Arvind has alluded to, foot and ankle has only really become a proper subspecialty in the last 15 to 20 years. And it's only recently that we're getting funding into these kind of injuries. The majority of research on most exercise physiology uh, research is on white male US college athletes. And why is this? There's a big military push and obviously having you know a young white male is recruited to the military get an injury early in their career 
that's going to be catastrophic and very expensive for the military. There is more funding going to these kind of athletes because male athletes, uh, male professional athletes do earn more money. And also these kind of athletes are more motivated. So they will often take on whatever study they can get that's going to give them an edge over their counterparts. However, recently we have worked out that women are not small men and we should not eat, train or rehabilitate like men. And the kind of injuries that women get are slightly different. And so there's a real focus now on female physiology and anatomy and injury prevention specifically in women. When we look at uh, Women's Rugby Union and the injuries that come with it, this was a really interesting paper that came out earlier this year from our New Zealand colleagues. Women rugby union players have a high incidence of head injury whilst playing rugby union. Their head injuries are more severe whilst playing that sport and they have an increased delay in treatment of the head injury. So their time to getting an MRI, access to occupational therapy and rehabilitation is longer compared to the men who have a treatment on site. And that is purely a funding issue and that women will not have sports physicians on site to assess and rehabilitate them during their games. They don't have immediate access to MRIs like the professional male rugby union players do and we've noticed that female rugby union athletes uh, have this higher incidence of head injury but also the long-term consequences associated with that such as uh, cognitive impairment mood swings and difficulty getting back uh, not only to sport but also to work and family life when we look at uh, ankle sprains we know that women are more likely to sprain their ankle uh, than men. And why is that? We're still trying to work it out. Women have an increased range of motion in all planes, particularly ankle uh, eversion. And we know that female soccer players and playing on the hard pitch associated with soccer is associated with a high increase of an ankle sprain compared to men playing uh, on the same pitch. Our anatomical risk factors, we can look at tibia vera in uh, women and tibia vera is a conversation for a whole other um, talk on limb deformity and deformity correction. But certainly whether women or women or men uh, who play on hard uh, pitches such as soccer, lacrosse, hockey, um, they're more likely to have a tibia vera if they go on to take a uh, take that sport professionally. So whether that's because that particular body type is better at those sports with hard grounds or whether playing those hard grounds throughout your adolescence closes your medial growth plate of your knee just a little bit, we're still trying to work out. We know that women have an increased calcaneal eversion range uh, of motion and the risk factors for men are actually a little bit different. So if you have an increased tailor tilt, you're more likely to sprain your ankle. But interestingly, uh, it was an increased risk with an individual sport, whereas females, it was very much associated uh, with soccer. When we look at our genetic risk factors, as I said, so females have an increased range of motion when running uh, in all planes, and that puts you at increased risk of uh overdoing it and rolling your ankle uh, more so than what the men would. I think an interesting study moving forward from this would be to look at the rate of ligamentous loose franks in female athletes. But again, that's probably um, a talk uh, for another day. What is a really interesting uh, fact is when we look at certain stages in the menstrual cycle, if we look at the ovulatory phase when your estrogen levels are at its peak, you actually have an increase in your postural sway. So women, when we're put on uh, balance, you know, specific balance exercises and we want to stand and shut our eyes and use your core stability, at certain stages during your menstrual cycle, you lose that and you lose a little bit of your proprioception and the ability to hold your ankle in space. And so theoretically, these women at this particular stage of their cycle are at risk of uh, doing an ankle, which can go on to have chronic uh, implications. So I hate to say it, but I had to look up the uh, menstrual cycle uh, as part of this talk, as embarrassing as it is. And there are two peaks. So if we look at this pink wave 
ear, that's estrogen, okay? And that happens just before uh, women ovulate. And then you have a second smaller peak of estrogen uh, just before you start your period. And female AFL players or female uh, athletes are most at risk of developing an acute uh, ACL injury right at that peak here. So just before uh, they ovulate. What's really interesting is progesterone, uh, which is a, another hormone with some similarities uh, to testosterone, peaks in this luteal phase the same time as estrogen peaks. And progesterone does have a few similarities in testosterone in that it makes you feel a bit stronger, you get more energy. And women are actually at risk of overuse injuries during this time because that's when they tend to feel their best during the training cycle. So specifically when you're doing uh, weight training and powerlifting, this is the time when, you know, physios and exercise physiologists and uh, strength training coaches are very wary of for women during their cycle and they need extra supervision uh, in the gym. But what I think is happening is women at this peak estrogen phase here, and then to a lesser degree at this ease here, are at risk of uh, rolling their ankle because it has been shown this is an increased risk of ACL injury. Um, the reason for that, when we talk about uh, collagen and collagen uh, estrogen receptors, you get these little estrogen receptors that sit on collagen fibres and it actually makes the collagen a little bit slacker compared to what it is during other stages of the cycle. And the reason for that is because estrogen is associated to when you have a baby. So when you have a baby, you want everything to be floppy. So the baby comes out easily. I wish that happened every time. It certainly didn't with me. But when you look at the um, the role of, of estrogen and uh, making your ligaments a little bit more loose, um, it has the consequences of making uh, collagen a little bit loose and dysfunctional uh, as well. So there are some issues obviously associated with trying to assess uh, the menstrual cycle. It can be really, really difficult to assess the menstrual cycle and where women are up to in that. And certainly, you know, female athletes undergoing studies, uh, having blood tests, you know, nearly every day to work out their hormone levels uh, is not always particularly tolerated. In addition, uh, women, particularly endurance athletes, so runners, uh, triathletes, uh, gymnasts, rowers, do tend to get athletic amenorrhea where the menstrual cycle uh, can either become altered or stop uh, altogether. So that's a real issue when we're talking about how to, you know, assess the menstrual cycle in that these women are often, um, you know, have abnormal menstrual cycles anyway and may not be assessed and be able to assess their uh, menstrual cycle because it just doesn't go in a regular four-week cycle like it should be because of the stress that they're placing their bodies under. Um, women, obviously, you know, if you're trying to avoid getting pregnant, you take birth control and that can be, um, you know, make it difficult to assess where you are in your menstrual cycle. Uh, particularly in AFL, when we're looking at the larger or the more strong uh, role of a full forward or a full back in AFL, these women are bigger, they're heavier, they're trying to get, you know, jump higher and have a physical dominance over their um, defenders. And these women have a, we know they have a higher rate of polycystic ovarian syndrome um, in those athletes. And so trying to measure your estrogen levels in those particular athletes is really difficult because they don't have something to compare it to. So there's lots of issues for why it is hard to correlate your menstrual cycle um, to why you're having ankle instability, but it's certainly something to think about. And it's a fascinating topic to look into further. So when I have my female athletes, particularly, you know, women's AFL and soccer that play on hard grounds, I always, always assess for their tibia vera. We had really good comments from Ben and Nick looking at the importance of hind foot alignment and uh, looking for a varus heel, which is really important. But you've actually got to look, I think, in my opinion, particularly in women, look higher up and look for tibia vera as well because often the ankle's straight but then they have these 
you know, bowed legs that are associated with that. So you've got to look at trying to consider how much their tibia vera is contributing to their ankle instability. Um, whether there's a role for an internal brace or not, I'd love to, you know, have a panel discussion about that because particularly in postpartum women, so women that have had a baby within six to 12 months, women that are still breastfeeding, their ligaments are lax and their collagen is full of estrogen and other hormones. And so it's dysfunctional, which, which we know. So whether there is a role for an internal brace uh, in those women, because their tissues aren't particularly functional. And that's certainly something I talk to my postpartum women uh, about when they're coming up for ankle instability surgery. Um, I think it's really important to consider the ground surfaces that women are playing on um, because it's an increased risk having a playing on a harder surface for a recurrence of their ankle instability. And there are some amazing exercise physiologists, strength and conditioning coaches and rehabilitation uh, practitioners that I work with quite closely for their for female athletes. And there's a whole rehabilitation program designed for female athletes to prevent them getting an ACL and I get prevent them getting an ACL injury. And I think we really need to look at taking some of those principles and pushing it to ankle uh, instability prevention uh, as well. So finally, what can we do as surgeons to help our uh, female athletes. I think we need to recognize that eating disorders and disordered eating is rife in female athletes. Certainly in my practice, I've seen an increase uh, in women returning to sport. We've had a lot of lockdowns in Victoria, in Melbourne, um, where I've where I've lived and sport just got put on hold. And as soon as it all opened up again, um, we just had a raft of stress fractures and what was happening in young adolescent women is not only were they returning to sport at a really high level very quickly having not done much at all for two years but a lot of them had suffered anxiety and depression as a result of these lockdowns that we'd had in Victoria and part of the way for women or these young women to deal with that was to control their eating and Many had lost weight and many had focused on a, you know, a wellness diet or restricting certain foods such as, you know, veganism and, um, you know, fructose free, which is all very valid, but there were a proportion of my patients that were using that to restrict their uh, calorie intake and popping up with stress fractures. So that's certainly something that we as surgeons uh, can see and try and manage and engaging a sports physician and a good general practitioner and the patient's rehabilitation providers are really, really important and picking it up early and asking the questions. Do you have a bad relationship with food? Have you had an eating disorder in the past? How are you feeling about your weight? These are all things that we need to ask our uh, athletes because it's going to affect their recovery and whether they return to sport. I think asking about menstrual cycle abnormalities is really important. Um, particularly if women have athletic amenorrhea or their periods are abnormal um, because it's such a risk factor for getting osteoporosis and uh, complications later in life. Definitely knowing, uh, you know, good sports physicians, good general practitioners with an interest in uh, women's health and particularly uh, female athletes is, is really important. I've got, I'm so lucky that I've got a, you know, a, couple of people on my phone I can call if I'm if I'm worried about people who will see these patients urgently if I am really worried. We do need to think about rehabilitation considerations and uh, strength training uh, is so important uh, for women. There's lots of awesome research coming out about the importance of uh, weight training and not just you know five lots of 15 reps in the gym with five kilogram weights we're talking about proper strength training squatting your body weight you know single leg press of your your body weight and really building up your strength and your power uh in the gym and engaging allied health um for safe techniques for that and that is really important for women not only for them to participate in sport um, and prevent them from getting injured, but also stop them having complications such as osteoporosis uh, later on in life. 
Another fascinating thing that's come out is looking at the nutritional considerations specifically for female athletes. During that luteal phase, just before you start your period, women need an increased protein and salt uh, intake. And the traditional carbohydrate loading, I did the Hawaiian Ironman uh, 20 years ago. And when I did the Ironman, it was all about just carbo loading and, you know, eating 600, 700 grams of carbs a day in the days leading up to your races. And that's really changed in that we need to look at increasing our protein and our salt intake um, so that we can have a better recovery uh, after these races. And it's actually women need to eat less carbohydrate um, than what we what was initially thought. And particularly, we don't need to eat nearly as much as what the men do. So this little girl here, that's my daughter. Um, she's a pretty good basketballer. She's not a bad swimmer. And I think that the sporting world that she is going to go into um, is going to be a very different one from the one that I went through and even from the athletes that I'm treating now. And I'm so excited about where the research on women's sport, uh, ligamentous laxity and injury prevention is going in the future. Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much, Amy. It is such an eye-opener, this topic. And I must say all of us are pretty impressed with the kind of work that is being done as well. I know we are running short on time, but I just got one question. You already touched on it, Amy, the use of internal brace. I yeah. certainly use it when we have very attenuated ligaments to repair or there isn't enough for you to get a feeling of satisfaction when you do a Bostrom roll or a Carlson. So I've used it in those instances. What have your experiences been? Yeah, I'm, I'm the same. When I started doing a lot of ligament reconstructions five years ago, I was a bit like Ben and I got, I got burnt. Um, I had to take two out and I had one young male footy player who just never went back because I, I over tightened him uh, and he just, he never made it back properly despite me taking him back and taking the internal brace uh, out. And I was very hesitant, you know, when I started my private practice because I didn't want people to have a recurrence and now I've come a bit of a circle and I'm very, very hesitant to put them in because I don't want to over tighten them. Um, I think there is a role, as you said, for people that have had uh, very attenuated ligaments. And I think there is a role in women who have recently had a baby um, because their ligaments are so stretched and crap that I think there is a role for an internal brace. Absolutely. But definitely not for everyone. Thank you, Amy. Thank you very much. A quick question to Nick. Nick, when you have an associated intra-articular pathology, what sequence do you employ when you operate on these patients? Do you go for scope first, do everything intra-articular, then go and do an open repair of the lateral reconstruction? How do you go around planning your surgery if you have an intra-articular pathology along with the lateral ligament laxity? Yeah, um, I... Uh, the answer is I do my scope first, one for diagnostic pro, uh, processes as well. Um, Preoperative imaging will also give me a bit of an indication about whether or not I think I can get it to it from arthroscope, you know, with the arthroscope as well. Um, if it's sort of on that intralateral sort of area or where uh, the fibula might be getting in the road on the, um, the lateral side, I'll try to do as much preparation as possible, but then actually go to the open. Um, and usually because it's unstable, push the fibula back a little bit and then uh, do a bit of open work. Uh, so that's probably the other case. If I'm really doing something on the medial side, um, I've got a low threshold for a medial malleolar osteotomy, in which case then um, uh, arthroscopy is really for confirming everything, getting more information and converting to open. Thank you so much. Look, I think we're running out of time. This has been an absolutely fantastic session. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Ben. And thank you, Nick. Yeah, thank, thank you, you guys. Much. What a fantastic session, Arvind. Thanks for moderating. Great seeing all of you. Thanks to Ardalan for sponsoring, and we'll see you guys in a few moments. And thank you for the opportunity. Bye.